Hello, class. In this lesson, we're going to learn about symmetry. To start, we have this example. And we have reflected triangle A over this line here. And that gives us triangle B. And then we reflect triangle B over this up second line and get this dashed triangle. But a student, Carlos, looks at this and says, hey, this last triangle, that's not from two reflections. That's from a rotation. We just rotated A is what he's saying. Do you agree? Well, turns out that Carlos is correct. We didn't actually do a rotation, but whenever you do two reflections, you're, you're also doing a rotation. And the center of rotation is going to be where the two lines of reflection intersect. This takes us to our discussion on symmetry. You've heard this term before. In algebra, you learned about the x axis of symmetry of a parabola. Same idea here. So if we look at just triangles A and B for a moment, we have their line of reflection. It turns out that's also a line of symmetry. If we were to draw triangles A and B on a piece of paper, and we folded that piece of paper along this red line, triangle A would lay exactly on top of triangle B. So that's what we mean by symmetry. And to talk about rotations for a moment, if you want to figure out the angle of rotation, like we did in the previous lesson, you connect that center of rotation to a pair of corresponding points in the image and pre-image, and then you measure it. And be careful, we're going clockwise here. So if you measure it with a protractor and you get that uh, obtuse angle, make sure you write clockwise with it. Here we have a little bit of vocabulary recall. On the left, we have an equilateral triangle, which is also a regular triangle. And on the right, we have a regular pentagon. And the term regular means that all of the sides of the polygon have the same measure, so they're congruent, and all of the interior angles have the same measure. So here's a more formal definition of a line of symmetry. Essentially, if you have a point on one side of the line of symmetry and its corresponding point on the other side, they must be equidistant from the line of symmetry. So if we're looking at this isosceles triangle, where would we draw the line of symmetry? We would draw it through the vertex and through the midpoints of the base. And so if we were to reflect this left-hand side uh, over the line, it would lay exactly on top of the right-hand side. Now, does every single figure in geometry have a line of symmetry? No. Remember, figure just means any, any set of points on the plane. So it doesn't have to be a polygon or a circle. So here I have a little speech bubble. And there's no way that you can reflect this over a line so that it lays on top of itself. You have this little tail down here, and that, that causes it to have no lines of symmetry. So here's a few polygons, and we're going to figure out which ones have lines of symmetry. So we'll look at it for a moment, and then we'll reveal the answers. Turns out, only the rectangle and the hexagon have lines of symmetry. And now, we want to draw those lines of symmetry in there. So take a moment and look at the rectangle and the hexagon, and try to draw all the lines of symmetry that you can. So, the rectangle has two lines of symmetry. And how can we verify that those are lines of symmetry? You could do some measurements. Or you could draw on a piece of paper and fold it. Make sure that it lays on top of itself. Now, how can we be sure that we don't have any more lines of symmetry? One way to do this is through exhausting all possibilities. What do I mean by that? Take any point not on one of the lines of symmetry. So I'll pick this corner. Where could we possibly reflect that so that it lays on top of another corner? Well, we could reflect it over this vertical line, and it would end up over here. Or we could reflect it over, over this horizontal line, and it would end up over here in the bottom left-hand corner. Those are the only two possibilities. You can't get this corner to go to the bottom right without doing more than one reflection. So we exhausted all possibilities for where we can put that vertex. Same idea for the hexagon. Hexagon actually has six lines of reflection. And once again, you can exhaust all the possibilities to make sure that there's no more than just those six.
Now, we also have rotational symmetry. Basically, it just means that you can rotate a figure onto itself, but that rotation has to be between 0 and 360 degrees. Which one of these figures does not have any rotational symmetry? It's this right triangle over here. There's no way we can rotate that onto itself. But for the other three figures, we can. So we'll come back to them in a moment. Let's look at this equilateral triangle. We're going to follow these steps to find out where its center of rotation is. And it's very similar to what we did when we found the circumcenter of the triangle. We want to construct at least two perpendicular bisectors for the sides. And here's my construction down here. So point D is the center of rotation. So that's the circumcenter. We have the perpendicular bisectors of, this, of these two sides. And remember, we also had something called the in-center. And how did we form the in-center? That was the point of concurrency of the angle bisectors. And it looks like that these perpendicular bisectors are also angle bisectors. So it turns out that the in-center and the circumcenter of an equilateral triangle are the same exact point. And so since this has rotational symmetry, if we rotate it around this point D, it will map onto itself. Now we're going to learn how to calculate an angle of rotation. Remember, there's a center of rotation, and if you took any point and rotated it all the way around, that would be 360 degrees. So we're going to use that property. To do this, you take any figure, and you want to see how many times you can map it onto itself with the rotation. So here's one. And if we keep going, we should get two. And finally, back to the original one for three. So there's three different rotations we can do that map it back onto itself. And 360 degrees, so how many degrees must be in each rotation? 120, right? Divide 360 by three. And here is a, here's how we did that. So you just divide 360 degrees by how many times you can map it onto itself. That is called the angle of rotation, and you want to pick the oops, we'll type you want to pick the smallest one that maps it onto itself. So the other ones are angles that will map it onto itself, but the angle of rotation specifically is the smallest one of those. And the number that we're dividing by, the or, that's called the order. So the number of times you can map it onto itself is the order of rotational symmetry. And so for the equilateral triangle, these are the three different measurements that will map it onto itself uh, that are greater than zero degrees. But the one that I highlighted is the angle of rotation, 120 degrees. For the rectangle and parallelogram, their order is two, one, and two. And similarly for the parallelogram. And for the regular hexagon, let's see, we have one, two, three, four, five, and six. So 360 divided by six is 60. So that's the angle of rotation. And here are the other five uh, measurements that will map that regular hexagon back onto itself. And that last type of rotation we did, the one of 360 degrees, is called an identity symmetry. Remember, the identity in algebra uh, we had the additive identity and the multiplicative identity. Those gave us the same element that we started with. So if we start with 3 and we add 0 to it, we get 3. If we take 3, multiply it by 1, we still get 3. Same idea holds in geometry. So let's go back to thinking about the equilateral triangle. What would happen if we rotated it 120 degrees three times? Well, we did that. We ended up with the original. Right? We rotated it 360 degrees. So we can call that uh, the identity function, so capital I. So whatever input you put in gives you the same, uh, the output's the same as the, the input. And so here's a way of thinking about that using the function notation we have for rotations. Doing these three rotations of 120 degrees is just the same as the identity. If you input triangle ABC, you will get a triangle ABC as an output. 
And so if you want to describe all of the possible angles of rotational symmetry we have, it's going to be a multiple of one of these three options. So if you rotated it four times, that's really the same as just rotating it once, right? Because you one, two, three back to itself, and the fourth one is just the same as the one rotation of 120 degrees. So these three rotations take care of all the different possibilities for the rotational symmetry. In this lesson, we learned about three different types of symmetry. Thanks for watching this video.